Indian Armed Forces are structured on the lines of the British Armed Forces back before we got independence. There hasn't been material change in it. Uh, the lowest unit is a section comprising of 11 men, graduates to a next level. Three sections make a platoon of 36 people. Three platoons make a company of 120 people. Six companies, four rifle companies and two support and uh, administrative companies make a battalion. The battalion is commanded by a lieutenant colonel, these days by a colonel, and this is the first primary fighting unit. Thereafter, the next structure of the army is a brigadier, a brigade, which has three units and other attachments and detachments like the artillery, the armored corps, the engineers, the signals, depending upon what the need is. And next graduation is to a division. A division has about three brigades, maybe four brigades at times. It is a strength of about 25 to 30,000 people, and that's the next level of the army. And finally, the last field force is a corps, which could even have 100,000 people of all arms and services, and that's the highest field force. And after that, of course, the administrative command of a command headquarters and the army headquarters. Each one of these have ranks. A unit is commanded by a colonel, a brigade is commanded by a brigadier, a division is commanded by a major general, a corps is commanded by a lieutenant general, and the army is commanded by a chief of the army staff, a full general. We are also likely to introduce, which the Prime Minister has announced, an appointment of the CDS. And that would be yet another step in the organizational structure of the armed forces. Today our commands are on regional basis. We have a northern command which looks after the northern areas. We have a western command which looks after the western borders. We have an a, a eastern command which looks after the eastern borders. We have a central command which looks after the central uh, border area uh, with China. We have a southern command which looks after the uh, peripheral of the, uh, of the southern India. Uh, so basically we have these commands which are regional commands based on their geographical locations. In addition, we have a training command. Training command is also located up here presently in Simla, uh, which uh, evolves training doctrines, which involves uh, evolves uh, new techniques of warfare, and that are further disseminated. Uh, besides that, we have many schools of instructions. We have a schools of instructions for the armored corps, for the artillery, for the infantry, for the engineers, for the signals, all branches of the army. And that's how the whole uh, thing is structured. Structural reforms is a continuous process. It goes on as we develop techniques to do our job better. I'll illustrate with an example. If you saw the movies relating to the 1962 war with India and China, you found waves and waves of Chinese coming and waves of Indian troops going up and down, getting killed. Those days have gone. So the concepts are changing. Till very recently, till the time that I was in service, we used to think still in terms of how the Second World War was fought. You huge tank forces going into the enemy territory, large size infantry forces going inside. Today, there's a major change in the development of the strategic thinking or unfolding of operations. We are now thinking in terms of battle groups. Battle groups concept existed even earlier, but it is now becoming more crystallized. So as we go along and we see the military and the national objectives as to what could be our objective, the, the techniques change. The force levels earlier were much larger. The force levels today have been reduced much less, but made more, more combat effective. So it's a constant process. You must have read in today's newspaper even. There are some new concepts being tried out in the hills in the northeast. Uh, there are concepts tried out in Ladakh. So this is, a, this is a process of evolution. Contournments in the ancient days used to be area which used to segregate the armed forces or the military from the rest of the civil population. So that neither the civil population could, uh, could infiltrate into the minds of the military people in contournment, nor could the military people be exposed all the time to a civilian culture. But in the modern days, the relevance of contournment is reduced, except that our military installations are located there, therefore security is necessary. And since it is under army control, you find them better maintained, more clean. Uh, the basic idea is to keep the whole lot of military personnel in an area which is a bit secluded. But as developments are taking place, the seclusion is uh, uh, not so much. Um, the roads are getting opened into cantonments. 
but cantonments are basically the hub of military activity where training goes on where administrative work goes on where uh, where uh, uh, depots are located hospital military hospitals are located ordnance depots are located ammunition dumps are located so that is what the cantonment is all comprising of when i say uh, not on combat duty and a junior officer it means that he is not in a field area he is not in jammu and kashmir in the north he is not in siachen maybe he is in jodhpur maybe he is in bikaner maybe he is in he is in bareilly if that's the place he is located with his unit his day would typically start uh, at reveille which is at about 5:30 in the morning depending upon the year he will first go for a pt parade which will last for about an hour he will then get one hour's break to have breakfast and change into regular uh, regular uniform there'll be training in weapons there'll be training in tactics with his troops at the battalion level and below and that will go on till about 11:30 12 uh, depending upon the weather conditions there'll be a lunch break typically there be an hour or so rest in the afternoon everybody will be made to play games at about 3 4 o'clock in the afternoon till about 5 5:30 in the units there would also be a roll call which is where instructions are passed to the troops at about 7 just before troops go in for dinner and for an officer he would uh, go back to the officers mess uh, have dinner in the mess uh, many times it will be what is called a dinner night which will be formal way of eating food uh, along with the other members of the unit so it starts at pt goes through training goes through afternoon games goes through some kind of staff parade and goes through dinner all these are military activities which a typical day a young officer will follow inter forces coordination starts at the highest level from delhi we have a organization called the chairman chiefs of staff committee the senior most service chief heads this committee members are all these chief service chiefs this is from where the inter services uh, unity begins and this is where operational plans are discussed and put before the uh, cabinet committee of security so i would put it that the inter services cooperation or amalgamation takes place at the highest level at the at the chiefs of staff committee soon going to be replaced by the cds and at the cabinet committee of security at the government level at the command levels like eastern command western command northern command and southern command the head of the military the head of the air force have a jointness in developing operational plans take for example western command western command of the army is located at uh, at chandi mandir as you all know and the air at western air command is located in delhi when they evolve an operational plan the two cncs will get together the staff will get together and develop an interoperable plan similarly when we go to southern command or perhaps even some portions of other elements they would have the navy as well and the navy would be in, incorporated in development of uh, southern command plans uh, whatever plans they may be and so uh, the next level is the command headquarters then it comes to the core headquarters where physical uh, uh, utility of the uh, uh, forces are available so if an army core is to go into an operation they will have an air force representative available in the core headquarters to coordinate air effort and dovetail it with the core plan and similarly there could be something like a forward observation officer of the air force available even at the divisional level so it is at each level that the inter uh, operation is uh, coordinated and right from the ccs down to perhaps a division level technology has completely overtaken military op military techniques of routine warfare like the second world war today you can fire a missile for example you can fire an anti tank missile at a tank at a distance of about 4 kilometers and you aimed and fired it it's called fire and forget uh, weapon and when the, the missile is about to hit the hit the tank it has got capability to discover that there's another tank behind it which is which is which is which is the commander's tank it will change direction and go to the commander's tank now look at the change in technology so technology today is completely changing the military thinking in ancient years maybe 20 years ago you couldn't see anything at night today night is made like day with night vision devices we can shoot with rifles and various weapons 
in complete darkness because we got laser uh, weapons, we got uh, uh, night vision devices. Uh, look at communications. We can talk to anywhere, to anywhere, any, anytime. We can have live video pictures. You couldn't see across a hill what is existing on the enemy side across a hill. Today you have, you have, you have uh, technology available in the terms of drones, in the terms of area photography. So the entire development of military operations, Army, Navy, Air Force, has going through a major change day by day on how the technological developments are taking place.